I want to welcome all of you to the Wednesday morning study, and we are up to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 2 of that book, and we're looking at the theme and part of wisdom, and I want to talk a little bit about that in, in a moment, but the whole concept here of wisdom in a world that has lost it, it's a theme that we've been using a good deal in some other contexts as well, this whole theme then of, of finding wisdom um, and this living in with wisdom, the world has lost it. Uh, Corinth certainly was an example of the world system that has everything upside down. You see, we have the biblical value system and the world just inverts that. And so when we look at the upside down kingdom of God, though, from the world's point of view, it just does seem just that. It seems something wrong with it. You see, because in order for us uh, to uh, die, uh, to live, we have to die. And that's a backwards way of looking at life, isn't it? Um, the way uh, up is really the way down. Uh, the one who is last is the one who will be first. Uh, the scriptures teach us that it is the servant who will become the one who is great in the sight of God. It is the one who loses his life who finds it. It's the one who empties oneself that discovers the fullness of God. When we let loose of our agendas, we embrace God's true agenda for us. And one of the themes that I have seen over and over again is that I almost never actually want what I need. It's an interesting thought. What we no normally think we want is very rarely what we need. It's often through adversity and uh, setbacks that we come to discover and this is a common thing that you see in literature with a protagonist who has a lot of wants, but through adversity discovers that actually he comes to see what he needed. And there is a transformation that takes place. Um, the one who gives is the one who is received, it receives. It's better for us to, better to, uh, more blessed to give uh, to, uh, and then to receive. And yet everything's upside down. It's like the fact that our, our retinas, the light strikes our retinas and it, it's inverted. And then our brain has to turn it around, which reminds me of us, this moody science fil film. I think I sent it, uh, showed it to uh, us a number of, a couple of years ago about, and this is back in around 1960, and it's kind of amazing that they did it at that time. Um, what you had really was, uh, um, uh, this pair of goggles, and this massive goggles at that time, the technology of optics wasn't as great, um, and it inverted everything. And so they wanted to uh, experiment with, a, with someone to just see how would it be possible for the brain to interpret that and with those on 24-7 for him to actually turn it around? Would his brain actually be able to do that? And this is even before much was spoken about, about neuroplasticity. So it was kind of an advanced idea. And if, if you recall that, that video, and just look up Moody Science video, I think it's, um, I'm trying to remember what the name of that one is, but anyway, um, it's these inverted goggles then. He actually does, is able to do that after a period of time. And in fact, demonstrates it by wearing these upside down goggles while he's riding a motorcycle, and then later when he flies a plane. And so the question that arise, uh, arises to me then is when he took it off, how long did it take his brain to then get it back the other way? Because now he was seeing everything the other way around. Would his brain be able to do that? And clearly that's what happened. My thought on that experiment would be, of course, okay, let's put him back on and see if the interval between him, him, him uh, being able to invert the image would be shorter and might certainly be my guess. Uh, and then as I see it, it would, the interval would be diminish until eventually you could put him on. He could see a straight upside down, right, right side up, put him off, take him off. And he'd still, his brain would invert that. But I don't know. The problem was, I, as I understand it, is that the fellow um, had such headaches from doing this. But my prediction is that it would have been less and less because the brain had had this incredible capacity, effectively, of virtually rewiring in many ways so they'd be able to do that. Uh, it's an intriguing concept, how we can train ourselves through neuroplasticity. And so as we know, neurons that fire together, wire together. It's the same kind of a thing with this, that everything really approaches us from an upside down point of view as far as the word of God is concerned. And the way I'd like to see it is if the world will, if, if the word does not uh, judge the world, 
the world will judge the word and you have it one way or the other. And there are too many people who are trying to accommodate the gospel to the world's agenda in the quest for relevance. And when they compromise the message at all, then what'll take place then is that they'll become increasingly irrelevant rather than uh, truly relevant. It is the one who really sticks to the unchanging and unvarnished truth of God's word that is something that men could never make up it required special revelation for us to grasp what his pr true purposes are. Apart from that, then, we would not really have an insight into the fundamental questions of life. Who am I? Where am, why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Those basic questions, we would not be able to see it, and we certainly wouldn't see it from a biblical vantage point. Um, one of the themes that, I, that we see in the book of um, of First Corinthians, I'll just go backwards a little bit uh, to the very beginning of it. We were seeing that Paul is describing after he speaks about uh, the um, his experience with them, and he speaks about the fact that his desire is that they would not be divisive but be of the same mind, because there was a great deal of divisiveness that he's uh, alluding to in the church. And there was a lot of immaturity in that church as well. But then he speaks about the word of the cross being foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And so he asks this question, his rhetorical questions, where is the wise man, where is the scribe, the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish, foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And he then states that the Jews ask for signs, Greeks search for wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. He says to the Jews, a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So you see this upside-down value system that it goes contrary to the world system, whether coming from a Jewish background or from a Greek uh, perspective. It doesn't matter. Human wisdom will always be unable to understand the wisdom of God. It needs to receive it, and recognize this transcends my own grasp. This is a greater good. If we see from general revelation that God has created the world in such a way that he has made it um, available, the word of God is available, it speaks to us in a more broad or general sense. And so when we think about the, 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 the various the, the words of God, as you know, um, I always speak about God's infinite word, and that's his general revelation, which is manifested in the mac macrocosm, the midicosm, and the microcosm. We can see from that, Romans 1 makes clear, that his eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they're without excuse. And yet, there is another component besides his infinite word we've talked about, and that moves from general revelation to special revelation. And the special revelation is something that God has revealed in space-time history through his, his uh, apostles and prophets and uh, the, through the various oracles. And we see all that in God's inspired word. But then we realize that God's inspired word then points really to the incarnate word. Um, and it, that it points us to understanding what is that incarnate word? And the incarnate word, of course, would be Yeshua HaMashiach. The, uh, so he would be Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, who would come and fulfill all the prophets, prophets and the prophecies concerning him. And then the most amazing thing even more than this is that the God's incarnate word would become God's indwelling word and that Christ, who created the, the cosmos, is actually indwelling us even now. So this is an amazing concept when you kind of think about the implications are, are nothing less than astonishing. So when we, when we consider then the, the fact that um, we're looking at the, this whole idea of the wisdom of God concerning um, all things that matter, the things that t give us explanations that we could never arrive at on our own unaided wisdom. Uh, where, why is, are we here and what's the purpose of life? 
And then he, it's a kind of a humbling word when he says, not many wise according to the flesh or many noble, but he's chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the weak things, the, and then the base things and the things that are not, so that man, no man may boast before God. So when we come to realize this is grace and we understand it, it's always gift and grace. It's nothing that we have achieved or, or can be, should be proud of that we've accomplished, but rather it's the realization that God in his grace has lavished him, this upon us. And in the love of Christ then has given us this invitation to come to know him, whom to know is life eternal. And then we discover what our what true life is about. And we remember that uh, the scriptures also reveal, and this is very evident in many texts in the New Testament, particularly Romans 6 through 8, that we are now seated with him in the heavenly places. Colossians 3 makes this very clear as well. So that in a very real sense, we're already now with him, and yet Christ is in us and we are in him. And so in this physical, uh, uh, more in our mortal state, then we discover as well that we're amphibious beings moving through this world then and moving toward a telus. Um, a teleology means an end, a direction, a purpose, and we are heading somewhere and we're heading home. And so God's desire for us then in this world is to become more and more shaped by who he is calling us to be, often involving suffering that which shapes us. But ultimately, though, we are pilgrims in this world and heading uh, toward home. So it's a mindset, it's a way of seeing. Continuing on uh, with Colossians, um, he then continues by saying, I didn't come with superior speech, but he came instead saying, I've determined uh, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so uh, he speaks about weakness, weakness and fear, not trying to be a, a convincing communicator, someone who's slick, but rather I came to understand in my own life that this gospel doesn't depend upon the wisdom of humans, but rather on the power of the living God. So that is one of the things that in which we have to move as well, moving forward in his um, a sense of uh, conscious and increasing dependence upon him for our well-being for all the things that come to us that are good and true, all they come from God. And so we have to depend upon him and not upon our own uh, folly or our own way of, of understanding. So in this soul forming world, then we're becoming more and more what God wishes us to be. And it is through his grace and power that it becomes so. He says, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. He says though, it's a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. So each of these ages, the rulers come and they go. They have their place in the sun, and then soon the sun sets and they're gone. Another generation replaces them. But it is the God who made all things then, who controls the times and the seasons. And he raises up the people he wishes to raise up and deposes those who wishes to depose. And yet his purposes will not be defeated because of the, uh, the machinations of men. Instead, he says, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. Now he speaks of this as a hidden wisdom, which God predestined before the ages uh, to our glory. He then says, it's a wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. So this is a powerful text then. It reveals to us then that there are things that we are right now incapable of fully grasping, things which eye hasn't seen or ear heard. Um, we do not have the capacity, but one day, and God will make it so, we will then be fully conformed to Christ. And just as we are now declared righteous and perfect in him in the heavenly places, so too uh, in this soul forming world, our souls, our minds, our wills, our emotions, our desires, our, our aspirations, um, our choices will all become as we walk in the power of the spirit, as we trust in the father, as we abide in the son, 
the more we do that and the more we renew our mind with the word, then this becomes a process of continued growth by the grace of God so that eventually we become more and more conformed in our practice to whom we already are in our position. So we're new beings, but we're also becomers. So we're becoming in this soul forming world who we already are in a very real way. And so one day then we anticipate then when we uh, go before him that we will then uh, be purged and purified in our soulish self and at the at the bema of Christ and at that at that judgment seat of Christ then all that the, Paul calls the flesh all those things will be removed and then that which remains will be perfect in all respects our our thoughts our wills our desires and for the first time you could allow a person to even see how you think and 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 feel so it's going to be an amazing thing and if that wasn't enough spirit and soul our bodies will be also resurrected like christ's own glorified body and then moreover there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any pain, nor sorrow, nor suffering. The old things have passed away. And if that weren't enough, it's also true that the world will and its systems will be gone, and the devil and his angels uh, will be defeated. And even this flesh then, all the world, the flesh, the devil, the downward pulls will be removed. And then we move into a new creation, a new context in which eye hasn't seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared. We don't have the capacity, I believe, to know it. But it goes on to tell us, for to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So he's telling us then that spiritual truth is spiritually attained. You cannot apprehend this. You cannot arrive at it without the power of the Holy Spirit because he speaks about that need. And that's why we've seen before in Paul's four life-changing prayers that it's in fact the Holy Spirit who must reveal these things to us, that um, it must be in fact him who shows us what this life is to be about. That, that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. So you need that spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the true knowledge, the real knowledge, the, the uh, epigenosco, the real knowledge of him, which means effectively the knowledge of him in a personal way, a re experiential way, in a relational way. That requires the eyes of our hearts, inter interesting metaphor, to be enlightened so that it requires God's work to make this clear. Otherwise, you'll not know about the hope of his calling. You'll not know about the riches of the glory of his inheritance. You'll not know about the suppressing greatness of his power. But we also see in this prayer in uh, Ephesians 3 that we are ask, uh, he's asking uh, that we would be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, the deepest you, so that Christ would dwell in your hearts fully through faith. And then you begin to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. So you're having a form of knowledge that goes beyond human knowledge. And this requires, again, the revelation of the spirit. We see as well in, in Philippians 1, that great prayer. And again, these are on the uh, spiritual renewal cards that your love would abound still more and more in real knowledge. So that again, this is, requires the, the grace, the revelation of God himself, the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. You can't get this apart from that grace. And that's really what it comes back to again when we're looking at this concept of that the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, again, this contrast between human and the divine, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. So spiritual and spiritual, they go together. But he goes on to say a natural man, a person who does not have the Spirit, doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. He cannot understand him because they're spiritually appraised. So he's effectively saying again that unless you have the Spirit of God revealing and illuminating these truths, um, and he uses the Spirit of God, uses the Word of God, and he reveals 
uh, those truths to us, to the person of God who desires to know those truths, who submits to them. And the more then that happens, then we see a process in which it is in fact the Spirit of God who uses the Word of God in the man or woman of God to actually convey the power and the message of God to others. And so it be, it's something he chooses to do in us and through us as us. Rather than doing it directly, he chooses to use us, gives us this grace, this dignity of participation in his eternal purposes, which again is mind-boggling because we can't even understand the fringe of his ways in anything in the created order. And so we look at this mystery, these truths, and we realize we've got to really be dependent upon him. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So it's this mindset, this understanding that really is being contrasted uh, from, from one to the other. So if we go back to, um, the, again, this first card that I so often refer to, my emphasis here is for us, once again, to this day, trust the Father. Because you need, to, if you are going to grow, you're going to trust the Father, you're going to abide in, in Christ, you're going to walk by the Holy Spirit, and you're going to renew your mind with the Word of God. And so you're going to allow that to be something that um, is lavished upon you so you can grasp your true hope, your true dignity, your true identity. Because then once we come to know our true identity, we come to know who and whose we are. And these are truths we could not have known or construed apart from God's special word of revelation that we are children of God, that we've been adopted into his family, that we've been justified, declared righteous, that we've been paid for and redeemed, um, that we will not be condemned by God, um, that we've been accepted in, in Christ. In fact, we're called to be saints, that we're new creatures, that we've been set free. We need to renew our minds with these truths. Whether we feel them or not is not the issue. It's a matter of choosing to believe that they are so in spite of our feelings and experiences to the contrary, then they become more real to us. So to say that we're holy, chosen, holy, and blameless before God, you may say, it doesn't seem like me, but that's not the reality. The reality is that this is who you are in the heavenly places. Whether you feel that way or not, you choose to acknowledge it as so, so you reckon it as true. So you know the truth, you reckon it as so, and then you respond by yielding and presenting yourself to him, as we see in, in Romans uh, chapter 6, this principle, um, that you come to realize you're here for a purpose, and that all these things, these, this, this wisdom then, of uh, being a citizen of heaven, of uh, being complete in Christ and raised up with him, that your life is hidden with Christ in, in God, that you've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, and it is this which provides the basis and the foundation for the security that we can now have in him. So the more you grasp your true identity in him, the more secure you are and able, enabled to love others and serve them. In spite of um, lack of reciprocity when that occurs, it doesn't destroy us because we know our who and whose we are. So it gives us a great a dignity and a great uh, affirmation. Um, so I'm gonna go back um, now to um, this overview uh, that we use, and this is from Handbook to Scripture. And, and um, what we have here is um, this, this collection of, of books that you know I've, I've used before, the, this, this Handbook series. And just to let you know here, um, when the Handbook to, to Prayer is designed, let me just pull this thing out here. So remember, the Handbook to Prayer is, um, we've got to renew our minds, and so I encourage you as, as uh, people who wish to know Jesus better, that one, there's hardly anything better you can do than to pray scripture back to God, and this takes you by the hand and guides you. I encourage people to use that in the morning and this hammer to renewal just before going to bed because it requires just uh, five minutes uh, to get those affirmations and somewhere in the day to read um, one of these 365 chapters of the Bible. So that becomes a kind of like a little a trilogy. But in, in understanding that then, we, we go back to this, this concept then of um, understanding of the need to renew our mind in a fallen world, a dark world, so we embrace God's light and truth in this fallen world, understand our times and know how we are to live. Uh, as we mentioned here um, and in, this, uh, in this material here, um, Corinth was a thriving center of commerce with two seaports, three seaports which were strategically located on a narrow isthmus between the Aegean and Adriatic seas. And so you can see it like this. And so if we look at 
um, our Corinth here, and we take a look at the city of Corinth, um, it gives us a, a perspective of how it is in this isthmus. Um, it, they even call this town Isthmia here. And here they also had the, what they call the Isthmian Games as opposed to the Olympic Games. And there was, a, there was actually a, a bima, there was a judgment seat to award and reward those who were people, who, uh, those who, ath athletes who um, did well at the games. So it's an image really of a, a image of reward. But it was a remarkable uh, city because here you had um, in many of the ruins that are still there, as you can see, um, uh, an opportunity to understand what was really going on in that time. It was this narrow isthmus. And um, in this context here, uh, there were a lot of pleasure seekers who had come to be entertained. In fact, there was uh, the Arcocorns, which was above the city. Um, and there, was a there were various temples and there were temple prostitutes. And so um, this became a, a center really of corruption and, uh, and debauchery. Now, during his second missionary journey, Paul established a church in that corrupt city and taught the scriptures there for 18 months in the years uh, 51 to 52. And so uh, there's a, we, we have a perspective on this when we look at the uh, missionary journeys of Paul. Remember that in Paul's first missionary journey in 48 to 49, he went from Antioch, all three started from Syrian Antioch, um, and they and they went down in this direction and then back again to Antioch. Whereas the second journey, one, the one we're talking about, 50 to 52, in this case, Paul then went from Antioch and went along this way, the opposite direction, and ultimately for the first time comes into what we would now call Europe. And uh, so we have uh, Greece, uh, Philippi, and then he works his way down to Corinth, spends a period of time there, and then goes to Ephesus on his way back. And then in the third missionary journey, then it will be again another visit as going this direction here and seeing the Corinthians yet again. Or, um, so this, this just gives you a perspective um, of what those journeys were like. So on his second missionary journey then, uh, we can see that Paul um, basically went in this direction here. And so as he goes from Antioch to Cilicia, uh, this is Syrian Antioch. So there's two different Antiochs here. And then he works his way over Philippi and then works his way down and goes to Corinth. And it's here that he spends uh, that period of time where he preached in the synagogue. And um, this is then he writes to them a uh, period later on, and he then um, communicates with them uh, in his uh, epistles that he writes. And then from Corinth, he also um, was involved in uh, reaching out to the Romans. And so this, is a, this just gives you the background, the backdrop and the perspective that we have. So he wrote this, uh, this to the church, He'd written at least one previous letter to them on his third missionary journey near the end, so he alludes to that. So he's telling us then, as we've seen, that the gospel transcends human wis wisdom. It's got to be spiritually discerned since it cannot be grasped, understood, or, uh, or uh, apprehended by this natural mind. My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. I think that even has to do with the way we operate in this world in terms of how we uh, seek to serve other people. And we do not seek to do it in the power of the flesh, although sometimes we get so dependent upon our programs and our, um, our communicators and uh, the, the techniques and, and so forth that we get away from the real sense, the simplicity of dependence upon the Holy Spirit as we elevate and, and, and communicate the truth of Christ uh, to a dying world. So we need to really use the weapons of the Spirit in this context rather than our own insights and understanding. So kind of a way of seeing this, it's been said that Christianity um, basically uh, preaches the infinite worth of that which is seemingly worthless and the infinite worthlessness of that which is seemingly so valued. And so it's an interesting idea. It's a, it's a matter of valuation, a matter of a perspective. And so one might well say, as one uh, put, person put it, that the, the biggest mistakes we make in life are mathematical. And by that, I mean that we miscalculate the brevity of life 
and the length of eternity, when we misconstrue the two and we put them in the wrong place, that is to say, we, we fail to see what really is going on. We miss out on understanding that we have to have an eternal perspective in this temporal arena. As one person put it, the leading, leading business in America is the junk business. And we don't uh, call it junk, but it's cars and clothes and finery and, and furnishings because tomorrow it becomes rusty and it begins to uh, generate, degenerate, and then it moves us away and the rust uh, is stolen. Uh, everything, uh, the, 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 it, it, it is corrupted, it is stolen, it is diminished. And we need to and desire something bigger and richer than what this world can provide. C.S. Lewis put it in this way, prosperity needs, uh, meets, uh, um, I'm sorry, Pri prosperity knits a man uh, to the world. He feels that he's finding his place in it, while really it's finding its place in him. His increasing reputation, his widening circle of acquaintances, his sense of importance, his growing pressure, the growing pressure of absorbing and agreeable work, all these things then build up in him a sense of feeling being really at home uh, in this world, which is precisely what the enemy wants for us, to have the illusion that this is home and to fail to grasp that actually the more we have this world's goods, if we're not careful, if we're not aware, if we don't hold them with a loose grip, we'll realize that that'll tether us to this world and cause us to be people who miss out on our true calling. So easily done, it happens all the time. It's, you can almost rec uh, make a comparison in terms of wisdom with this world being like a, a game of Monopoly. Remember, the whole idea is that uh, one rule of Monopoly would be acquire, acquire, acquire. And then rule number two, when the game is over, all the pieces go back in the box. And that's not a bad way of describing the human conditions, I'm afraid, in so many cases. Some people just seek to acquire, acquire, acquire. And even supposing that they control, control it from the grave, uh, they try to hold on to it, even to the, from the grave. And yet this acquisition takes us nowhere because all the pieces go back in the box. And so we have to have a mindset then of understanding what is God's real purpose in our life. I remember, that reminds me of these, these claw machine. Sometimes I'd go to these arcades when I was a kid. I, I remember one of those uh, machines, and some of you will as well, that they had this little claw and you had this little uh, levers that you had to control. You put a quarter in there and you could control and it had a little uh, a bucket that would then close and then it would uh, grasp something. Usually a bunch of junk on the bottom of the of the of the uh, enclosure. Uh, stuff you really wouldn't want to have but it became a big deal and you're trying to make it grab the thing and then just as you think you have it and you're going to put it over here it drops. That's almost the, the way people live. The futility of earthly pursuits apart from Christ is about like that, about that, like that claw machine is just not enough. Um, Malcolm Muggridge th 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 thought of this life as a staging post. And uh, he says it's, uh, it's too banal or trivial to be taken seriously or held in esteem. So he came to Christian faith uh, in late in life and he considered his deep abiding time of alienation in this world to be an important safeguard for his eternal hope. Listen to what he ha how he put it. Muggridge said, I had a sense, sometimes enormously vivid, that I was a stranger in a strange land, a visitor, not a native, a displaced person. The feeling I was surprised to find gave me a great sense of satisfaction, almost of ecstasy. The only ultimate disaster that can befall us, I have come to realize, is to feel ourselves to be at home here on the earth. As long as we are aliens, we cannot forget our true homeland. And I, that I think is really a wise word for us to hear, that uh, actually you are heading toward a specific homeland and we're aliens until we, we, we receive that. I've, I've shared this with you before, uh, the covers, uh, these are just concepts, or not what the covers are gonna really be like, uh, uh, just suggestions, but, um, for the new trilogy, uh, the books have come out and we're going to, our desire is to um, 
redo them uh, and use different covers. And the theme that I wanted was something that would actually show how you and I are really in this city right now. This is the world as we can see from the above and below. So each of these has above and below. And um, above we see um, what um, William Blake called the dark satanic mills. This whole idea of, of the corruption of this world, Vanity Fair, and the pathway that's leading out of that. And so having come to faith in Christ, we've passed through uh, what's called the wicked door in, in Pilgrim's Progress. And we move through and we begin on this journey and this woods. And then as we practice his presence in the present tense, then we see that above there's the light above the woods, but it's so thick um, that you can only see here and there a shaft of God light on the wood of our experience. And so life in the presence of God. So uh, rewriting your broken story had to do with uh, understanding your past and realizing that the way you fix your broken story, we all have one, is to embed your story in God's greatest story, the greatest story ever told. And he gives us a new dignity and destiny. And then in the present tense, we move to life in the presence of God and we seek to practice his presence throughout the course of this uh, earthbound sojourn. And then the third one goes to the future. So it really is a triptych that goes from past to present to future because here we're being shaped by suffering. You see, you see the, um, the, the pathway and there are thorns and so forth, but eventually it leads to the eternal city. So it's a kind of a symbolic way of, of grasping that what our true destiny is, is going to be ultimately uh, in the hands of the living God that uh, we must, and therefore we must care for our, our souls, our, our bodies rather, as though we're going to live forever. But we have to care for our souls as if we're going to die tomorrow. It's a very interesting statement that Augustine makes. And he means by this that um, regard your body as a, as a stewardship, and uh, it is a gift that God's given you, and you, you then use it and, and get getting, uh, not abusing it. So the amount of this, the sleep, the exercise, the, the nutrition does matter because um, we're seeking by the grace of God to uh, steward that body, that, that resource, to empower us and impel us to be agents for his grace. And so as we live and breathe and as we have vitality, we seek to be people in this dark world who actually manifest the eternal truth and light and love of the good news of Christ to this world in such a way that God has given us as an arena of influence, a sphere of influence of people that he's put in our lives and he calls us then to embed our lives into that. And so this is a, a mindset, a perspective that's necessary for us to embrace in this, uh, in this world. Um, one of the films I, I, I've taught a lot of movies and one of the films I sometimes teach a portion of is um, it's, it's uh, City Slickers and it has Billy Crystal. It's been out for a long time now, but it's still got a, some funny bits in it. And it's a guy who uh, hits his 39th birthday. And that's the, usually when you get into your begin your midlife crisis for many, usually between 39 and 43, you become aware of your mortality. And uh, when he is, um, his name is Mitch and he's, he's basically, um, he uh, plays the part of a bored baby boomer, though, but uh, he um, has to let loose about this deadpan monologue because he's not really doing well with his job. He feels like he's going nowhere. And uh, he's t he tells uh, his, uh, the, the, the children in this, um, in this classroom, the third grade, grade classroom, this crazy, uh, this crazy uh, monologue here, when he says, uh, v value this time in your life, kids, because this time... This time in your life is when you have your choices. It goes by so fast. When you're a teenager, uh, you think you can do anything and you do. Your 20s are a blur. 30s, you raise your family. You make a little money and you think to yourself, what happened to my 20s? And remember, he's talking, telling this to third graders. Um, 40s, you grow a little pot belly. You grow another chin. The music starts to get too loud. One of your old girlfriends from high school becomes a grandmother. 
Uh, 50s, you have a major, a minor surgery. You'll call it a procedure, but it's a surgery. 60s, you'll have a major surgery. The music is still loud, but it doesn't matter because you can't hear it anyway. 70s, you and the wife retire to Fort Lauderdale. You start eating dinner at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. You have lunch around 10 o'clock. Breakfast the night before. Spend most of your time wandering around malls looking for the ultimate soft yogurt and muttering, how come the kids don't call? How come the kids don't call? The 80s, you'll have a major stroke and you'll end up babbling with some Jamaican nurse who your wife can't stand, but who you call mama. Any questions? So it's a very funny deadpan scene. The kid, of course, won't understand. But you get to a point here where you become, if you're not careful, almost cynical. Where did my life go? Where, what, what was the meaning of life? Um, I'm reminded of that pathos when I think about this little this little uh, uh, short poem. When as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I daily grow, I daily grew, time flew. Soon shall I find in traveling on, time gone. So here is the wisdom that we need to gain, recognize the brev brevity of our earthbound sojourn. Be a person who then asks these fundamental questions uh, because we everyone needs to be afraid to die until we've done something that will always live. So this is the whole idea of what is your purpose in life? What have you been called to do? As one friend of mine put it, what are you bringing under your arm to the ultimate show and tell? And that's a good question for us to examine. Uh, write your obituary now and see if it would play well in heaven. So these are challenging concepts for us to recognize how short, how, how brief, how transitory, how ephemeral are the things of this world and the recognition that the things of the next world we're being prepared for. So as I see this wisdom, this wisdom that comes from above, it's a wisdom that guides us into another centered grasp because when we embrace God's wisdom, we come to see that he himself knows what's best for us and that what we think we want is almost never what we need. We have to learn what we truly need by submitting to the Lord Christ who indwells us, we are in him and he is in us. And for us then to seek his ways and his purpose and Lord, what would you have for me this day? And so we submit ourselves to God in the, and I encourage you then uh, again to submit and depend upon God. That's when I talk about um, it before you get out of bed. Uh, this day, I'm going to trust the Father, abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit. And then you commit uh, and obey. So you commit your, your plans to God, hold them with a loose grip and allow him to really guide you through the course of this day. And then you begin to walk in a wisdom, but you need to renew your mind on a consistent basis uh, because the world is so much with us that it will impose uh, itself upon us and distort our values. So we need to begin and end the day with the word, not the world. We need to be defined by what the word teaches us, not by the world. Only then, then are you secure enough to serve other people. Again, as I describe it, loving God completely is the key to loving ourselves correctly because the more we see and know who he is and what he's done for us, the more we grasp our true security, significance, and satisfaction in Christ. And loving self correctly then empowers us then to be secure enough to serve even when there's not a reciprocity. So we become people who are givers rather than grabbers, ministers rather than manipulators, people who love and serve um, because we do it uh, as unto the Lord, and that is where we find our true reward. I'll open it up now for some uh, interaction with you. If nobody's going to talk, I, I have something I was sort of going to wait for the other, but uh, uh, basically I went to, to a college that was sort of interesting, small college in Los Angeles. It was interesting to the fact in the 50s, Jack Kemp went there, and uh, I don't know when Obama went there, but his first two years, uh, because coming from Hawaii, there was a certain connection. Uh, he didn't go to Columbia all four years. He went to, to the other. Uh, I had a friend who uh, uh, 
Uh, we all, when we first got there, we were in a dorm. And he came from Venice before it was a trendy place. And he had long, greasy hair. And we were all in the dorm trying on our best behavior, you know, trying to say we were there for intellect in school. And the first nights that he was there, all I did is said, who wants to go out and get drunk? Mm. <laughs> you know? And they had a objective test in the history of Western Civ, and he got the highest grade. And he just stayed up all night the night before, you know, no goes or whatever. He was he was really a genius. And uh, uh, he went to UCLA uh, Medical School. Uh, uh, he did his uh, internship and residency there. Got uh, he had to do a little speed there and got in trouble there when he was in nuclear medicine. But he always used to say, uh, I come back to first the teacher that I talked to you about 40 years ago, 78, 79, through the Bible in one year of which he uh, did. And he always said such foolishness. We were all running around in college doing whatever we were doing. Drinking was there then. It wasn't as big a drug thing in the late uh, 50s, early 60s. And uh, he'd always say such foolishness. You know? <laughs> and uh, he ended up uh, uh, taking some abnormal psych, uh, uh, decided he was gay uh, over at UCLA and uh, uh, changed and fought. I came back to him the first end of his life and he, he just couldn't, he went to an Episcopal church. He says, I think there's something right about Christ. He was too smart. He had too much wisdom uh, to go for it. And he uh, finally died of AIDS, told people that AIDS, you know, wasn't anything. Uh, basically my teacher uh, his to all his teachers, I was in his class. He taught the teachers on Wednesday, and we went through the Bible in one year. And, and he had a, a thing, you know, it was the Bible according to Schofield. Uh, you know, that was the only Bible. But he he camped out on uh, twelve through fourteen, particularly thirteen, and maybe because I was a disciple of Kerouac, and uh, uh, more maybe more perfect guard than I should be. Uh, comparing, 13 says, comparing spiritual with spiritual. Holy Spirit knew, Holy Spirit inspired the word that breaks the code of, of reading. And uh, uh, you basically uh, come to that, you break the code, you compare in the spiritual with spiritual, Holy Spirit knew, you know, attached to Second uh, uh, Timothy 3 and, and, and the other. The last thing was a uh, Friday group I had had to, the head of litigation from one of the two law firms, uh, big law firms in town. And uh, basically he taught uh, chapter two, one through five. And he said, you know, with words, I can talk anybody into anything, you know? And he said, that's what, what Paul was talking about. He, Paul probably could have debated everybody. So in my first, I taught for 30 years, my first 10 years, I, I don't, I think every three weeks or so I'd go back to Corinthians one and two. So, I really appreciated the words today. I think don't want what we need is the story of my life. Yeah, I'm afraid that that's the story of all of our lives. I've been really chewing on that idea. Um, if it's true that we, um, what we think we want, uh, what we want to have is consistently not really what we need to have, um, there should be enough wisdom then to surrender and submit. So we hold our desires, but true prayer, as you know, is not to try to convince God to do what we want. Uh, we can give him our desires and uh, what we hope for, but don't hope in it. Um, and then almost every day, then you realize that the day brings things you didn't plan and you have to live into that and to recognize that God often guides us into things we don't want. And uh, that seem, but at the end, you look back and really it was a better good for us. But I'm constantly pushing back against that. So I recognize that um, I have to surrender my idea of what my best interest looks like, what I want, and to recognize that God knows actually what I truly need and then receive that, even though it's not something that I want it, I want him. And the more I want him, then I want what he has for me. So it becomes a question of moving into um, who gets to determine your real aspirations in life and what is your greatest desire. And if it's to really know and recognize that you are meant for something more than this world can provide, nothing that's uh, finite will suffice. No earthbound condition will be good enough. We were meant for more. 
And so, as, as Augustine says, you've made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. To find their rest in him is to realize that he is our chief and only good. So that whom do I desire but you? Um, that should be a growing aspiration to desire him um, even more than our construal of what his gifts might be. So that we, the more we realize that he has a better plan for us than we could have imagined or invented uh, on our own, the more we are willing then to submit them and to trust them enough to lean into that, um, into that way. That's good. Ken, this is uh, Dave. Uh, thanks for that hey, this Dave. morning. Yeah. Um, hey, what was the name of the poem? Something about time gone. Yes, let me, uh, I'll provide that to you. Uh, it's a little, I have it in a card and I wish that I had uh -huh. the, the. Um, I have, I have, Actually, a couple, several thousand of these little, these little cards that I sometimes forget to use. Um, but I can, I can, uh, I hope I can, I can find it for you. But it's a nice little poem. Um, I'll read it again though, because it says, um, let's see if I can figure this from. Uh, uh, it tells me where it's from. Okay, yeah, but it's. I got this thing years ago from a little magazine called Bits and Pieces. And so I don't know if I'll ever be able to figure out where it came from. But um, it's um, when as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full grown man, time ran. When older still I daily grew, Time flew. You can see what's happening. It just gets faster and faster. And uh, then he says, soon shall I find on in traveling on time gone. What's that trying to do? It's trying to cause us to realize and remind us of the reality we already understand that as we get older, time goes by faster and faster. Our perspective changes. And then we realize what seemed to take a year is, uh, and now it's it, a decade seems to be uh, in a year. And so our perspective... So this is why I have this phrase I like to use that age conspires with God to transfer our, our hope from the temporal to the eternal. There's a kind of a conspiracy that our physical mortality then uh, diminishes to be a reminder of the fact of, of not only that we are living in a fallen world and that's part of the curse, but also a reminder that we were meant for another world, you see. And so that whole idea, if all the things that you can find in this world are not su sufficient, uh, as Lewis puts it, then it's an indicator that we were meant for another world. And that is the world to which we aspire. And that's the word to, we're a world to which God draws us. And so it's a, but it's an intriguing thing how age has this way. Imagine if you were only uh, 20, uh, when, you, when you reach the age of, let's say 20, 22, uh, you stop aging. Uh, you'd never really have any aspiration for much because mm. you'd suppose this mm. world would be everything. <laughs> so God uses that, doesn't he, to, uh, it, yeah. as I say, in a conspiracy uh, to pull us away from that because it doesn't take any faith to recognize the brevity of this life. It takes no faith at all to believe that unless Christ intervenes, um, we're going to be gone in a very short order indeed. Our prayer and hope is um, the spirit and the bride say, come, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus, because our desire then is to be transformed and to be transmuted from this mortality to that immortality. And that's what Paul talks about in the resurrection in Roman, 1 Corinthians 15. But you're right, that's a tough struggle we all have. And the realization of that brevity of the earthbound sojourn is poignant. And Frank, um, there's a song, Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon. Yep, I remember that. I, I, I want to be just like you, Dad. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's um, mm -hmm. who? Uh, Excellent. Yeah, it's a good story about him. And, and the sad thing is that uh, he doesn't have time for his kid. And then when he has time for his kid, the kid doesn't have time for him. It's. Um, um, Harry Chapin. Uh, Harry, Harry Chapin. Chapin. Harry Chapin. And, Harry. And, and, you know, his wife told him, when are you going to listen to your own song? Because <laughs> that's exactly what's happening to you. Uh, so he was, he was struggling with that whole, that whole issue. But uh, the realization that if you are not treasuring this, this present, you're living so much in the future, trying to acquire and attain 
And that's that um, that aphorism I, you, you've heard before that we spend the first uh, we spend our, our, our in the first half of our life we spend our health trying to make wealth, and in the second half of our life we spend our wealth trying to get health. And that's a, right. that's a fool's paradise. <laughs> it's not going to work. And you can't stop the clock. It's irreversible. And so we recognize as time continues to diminish then, if we are wise, if we're prudent, we're going to see and treasure the things that will endure. And by the grace of God, he's told us what that looks like. He's given us this hope. Uh, he's planted eternity in our hearts. And that is enough then for us to have an aspiration for something that we know we need. We need to be, we want to be home. We're pilgrims and aliens in this world. So to recognize that true condition and then to desire, have a pray for the grace of holy aspiration to recognize how, teach us to number our days that we may know how, how uh, short it, they are, how few there are so we can have a heart of wisdom to treasure. And then you treasure the precious present and recognize <clears throat> this day is all I've got and live as if it's your last.